Welcome to the HBM Test and Measurement FAQ video series. Hi, I'm Bart Morick, HBM Applications Engineer, and in this video I'm going to provide a short presentation on choosing the right strain gauge when planning your experimental stress analysis test. One of the questions we often get from customers new to strain gauge measurements is where to start. Over the next few minutes we'll go over some of the basics to start when making a selection of strain gauges. We'll go over some of the different series of strain gauges we offer, the geometry of the packages, grid length, temperature compensation, connection option, adhesive and protective coating options, and finally wire connection options when using quarter bridge gauges before concluding. In most instances, the HBM Y series is the go-to gauge. It has a polyamide carrier with a constant hand metal foil that works perfectly with experimental stress analysis applications. There are exceptions that we offer such as the M series for high temp and fatigue, C series for higher temp, gauges that can be embedded in fiber composites, IP67 encapsulated gauges, weldable gauges, and high strain. The Y series are flexible and easy to handle, come in a wide variety of geometries. We offer them in many different temperature compensation choices and have the most common types typically in stock for immediate shipment. The grid is encapsulated and comes with a data sheet that provides you with gauge factor, transverse sensitivity, and temperature response curve. We also offer them in most common resistances of 120, 350, 700, or 1000 ohms. There are a variety of geometries available for strain gauges. Linear gauges offer a single grid where the main direction of the stress is known. A T rosette offers two grids, 90 degrees apart from each other, and used to measure the biaxial stress state when the principal direction is known. A torsion or shear gauge offers two grids, 45 degrees apart from the grid axis, in a V or chevron shape that allows you to determine shear stresses, such as something in torsion. A rosette offers three grids mounted either 0, 45, and 90, or 0, 60, and 120 degrees apart from each other for use when the biaxial stress state has an unknown principal direction. Parallel grids have two grids aligned together but not connected. These can be used when creating a measurement on a bending beam and making a full bridge measurement. These require additional wiring to interconnect the grids in the Wheatstone bridge circuit. A full bridge has four grids, 90 degrees apart from each other, for a full bridge measurement. A chain gauge gives you 10 to 15 quarter bridge gauge pre distance from each other to allow you to monitor the determination of stress gradients. A residual stress gauge has three or more grids with special geometry. It is used to determine the residual stress in a material by using the ring core or hole drilling method. The next thing to consider is the choice of grid length and the resistance you're going to need. Typical lengths are 3 or 6 millimeters, but many other lengths are also possible. For instance, you may need a smaller grid length when you are limited by the available space, such as placing them on a printed circuit board. Or, larger if you are working on inhomogeneous inhom materials such as concrete and want to avoid the voids in the material when you are making your measurement. The typical resistances are still 100 or 350 ohms, though 700 and 1000 ohm gauges are also available. A few quick tips for choosing a resistance would be knowing that a lower resistance gauge is more robust against insulation resistance and EMC interference. Higher resistance gauges allow for lower current flow and that prevents less self-heating, gives higher output, and works well when powered by battery. However, whichever resistance you choose, you must match them to the amplifier that you are using. If your measurements are going to be made over a varying temperature range, you're going to need to compensate for those temperature effects. The temperature response of a strain gauge should be adapted to the material that the gauge is attached to, and to do this we offer different adaptation choices. You should find the coefficient of thermal expansion for your test material before selecting a gauge, so that you can properly select the proper temperature adaptation value for your gauge. So you've gotten the proper gauge. Now you need to connect it to your data acquisition system. You can get the gauge with a variety of different connections that allow you to choose the one that best fits your needs. 
there's an integrated solder tab that allows you to directly solder your leads to. Other packages come with pre-attached copper leads that allow for mechanical decoupling of the cable from the steering gauge. Separate solder terminals are required. Solder tabs with strain relief. This offers the capability of both the previous gauges. You can solder directly on the gauge and it provides mechanical decoupling from the attached cables. But this is not available as a pre-wired gauge. Pre-wired gauges. We offer certain gauges pre-wired with 50 millimeters of Teflon wire connected to PVC cables of lengths determined by the customer. This allows you to quickly apply the gauge without having to solder at the installation point. The 50 millimeter Teflon wire prevents the cables from sticking during the application of the adhesive. In ESA applications, you typically use a cold curing adhesive such as Z70 or X60. Use Z70 for standard surfaces and X60 for absorbent and uneven surfaces. Protecting the gauge after installation is a good idea as it protects the gauge from mechanical damage or humidity. Some of our more popular protective coatings include PU140 for simple physical protection and against humidity. SG250 is a transparent silicone rubber for mechanical protection and AK22 or ABM75 is a putty and aluminum foil for extreme protection. Lastly, how many wires do you need to connect your strain gauge to your amplifier? You can use a two wire connection is the easiest to connect and the lowest cost, but there are issues. The resistance of the cables and temperature changes affect the measurement signal. The quality of the signal gets worse as the cables get longer and you can lose resolution because the circuit becomes unbalanced. So you should avoid two wire connections if at all possible. With a three wire connection, the bad effects of the two wire connections are mostly eliminated, though there is some asymmetry of the cable that can influence your results. With certain HBM amplifiers, we can use a four wire technique that corrects for the issues above and provides for the best possible signal. So in conclusion, when choosing the right strain gauge, you need to consider the series of the gauge, the geometry, its grid length, temperature compensation value, how to wire it, which adhesive and protective coatings to use, and the wiring considerations for when you connect your strain gauge to your data acquisition system. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, please feel free to call, email, or visit our website for the latest product solutions and downloads at www.hbm.com.